All right, so welcome to Livestream Stars. I'm Ross Brand. This is the show where we feature top quality broadcasters delivering high quality content across live stream uh, platforms. And my guest tonight is the great Mitch Jackson. Mitch is oh an goodness. attorney in California, Orange County's Jackson and Wilson is uh, the law firm. He was a recent speaker at uh, the Periscope Summit, uh, Summit Live, I think it goes by now, Mitch, uh, but is formerly known as the Periscope uh, Community Summit. And Mitch has interviewed so many great people. He's had uh, everybody from Seth Godin to Gary Vaynerchuk to uh, Guy Kawasaki. Um, he has streaminglawyer.com as his uh, online hub, but he has other websites where he delivers communication tips and information for aspiring lawyers. Um, he's, he's gotten into a lot of different issues and, and really one of the, the more, I, I'd say you're probably the most well-known lawyer on live streaming. So I guess to dive right in, you're, you're, you're a former California attorney of the year, uh, Orange County attorney of the year. So what made you go into this live streaming thing? It sounds like you got a real job and uh, you're doing pretty good for yourself. <laughs> it keeps life interesting. Well, first of all, thank you for having me on your show, Ross. And thank you yeah, for the very for kind and generous and undeserved uh, introduction. I really appreciate it. Everyone that's here, thanks, you guys. It's really cool to see everybody. Tell little little bird, let's tweet this out. Let's get some, let's get some butts in the seats. Um, you know, look, I've always uh, enjoyed innovative technology and any type of technology, Ross, that allows me to connect with more people and help more people. That's why Lisa and I became lawyers. We wanted to help people. And um, what social and what live streaming has allowed us to do is expand that help aspect of what we do from Southern California globally. And almost on a day, it was on a weekly basis, almost on a daily basis now, we're being contacted, you know, from, in one way or another, from somebody on the other side of the world that has a legal question or has a matter in California and we're able to help them or get them going in the right direction. So that's why I jumped all in. Streaminglawyer.com, we put together that, that, that WordPress site, Ross, just before Social Media Day in San Diego last year. Wow. Tyler Anderson's just awesome, awesome event because I tasted live streaming. I felt live streaming, I experienced live streaming, and I thought to myself, I'm going all in on live streaming. And it's really been the best decision we've ever made. It's just so much fun. So right. thanks for having me on. And you're very community minded as well. I, I know you're involved with um, different community service projects. And so live streaming has been a great way for you to um, call attention to those and draw, draw other people in. And the question I guess I get from a lot of people because I'm not trying to monetize this at this time. I'm just enjoying the platform. So a lot of people say like, oh, well, nobody's making money off of this. Or, you know, people are just asking other people to to get on it for no reason. Or they're pitching it to clients and the clients have no, you know, there's no ROI or whatever. I, I imagine that if somebody has a legal question in California, as you said, they're going to come to you because you're more well-known and visible, at least in the social media community, than any other lawyer I can think of at this time. So uh, there's got to be some sort of ROI for you in addition to being able to help people and doing good things in the community. And, and, and there has been for us. It's huge. The ROI has been absolutely huge. I don't want to go into details uh, during the show for privacy purposes, but right. it's uh, it's in the seven-figure range. And wow. uh, yeah. And so we're, we're in a unique business where some of the cases that we have that come in are big cases. But look, that's not that's not why we're doing what we're doing. That's not why I encourage people to engage on live streaming and social. This is a great way to build relationships. And it Ross, is. you and I, you and I met on on social. We met on live streaming. Nancy Merlin and I have met. We've since done shows together, webinars together. Um, we've communicated back and forth, referred business back and forth. The point is, it's a great way to build relationships. And I think if you get into live streaming with that thought in mind to build relationships, everything else falls into place. And I've seen everything. I mean, when I opened up my practice, Ross, it was 1986. It was before the Internet as we know it. Lawyers were placing ads in yellow page phone books, which I never enjoyed doing. That's not my personality. Right. They worked back then. They don't work as well anymore. 
But um, with the advent, and I've seen everything come along, and with these platforms, it really allows all of us to show our human side. It allows all of us to communicate and help each other and really, you know, become a community together. And that's what's exciting about it. Well, you've really um, become one of the top people at doing it and and have a great way of of communicating. And is there a way, uh, you know, in, a, in sort of a short answer before you hit the meat of the, the legal issues um, sure. where you could distill how you communicate, like how you communicate so effectively um, via live streaming and are able to really provide value in 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 those short like Snapchat videos or in a Periscope um, and sure. really hit the heart of what you want to get across um, because it's something people should should really observe and can learn from. Well, I think what people, first of all, I wish I could do an interview as well as you. I mean, and I I'm, I say that I'm serious, Ross, because I don't like the way I look on live streaming. I don't like the way I sound on live streaming. I'm not the most articulate person in the world. I like to speak from the heart. That's been my success in trial. I'm never the sharpest knife in the drawer inside that courtroom, but I'm the most effective because I can communicate and connect and build rapport with my jurors. I just, I've learned how to be myself. And what I would suggest that people do is, Whatever you do for a living, whatever your business, whatever whatever you do every single day, just write down the 10 or 20 most often asked questions that you get each and every day from clients or customers, okay? Or each and every week or each and every month. And hop on a Blab, hop on a Periscope, hop on Snapchat and answer each one of those questions. Break them down into three or four sections. One, two, three, and four, and go for it and be consistent. And as everyone knows that's watching this, live streaming, social media, it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. So it takes time. It takes time to build up an audience. But by repurposing our content, by sharing it on the different platforms, by treating your platforms as welcome mats, welcoming people to connect with you and build relationships with you, that's the secret sauce where a lot of professionals make mistakes, a lot of marketers make mistakes, is that they constantly add a call to action to everything they do on social. And social is a two-edged sword. While it will allow you to build really, really strong global relationships, if you go about it the wrong way, you can sever a relationship just like that. So you right. want to be careful with how you go about using social and live streaming. But I'll tell you right now, I'm, I'm in the middle of a post where I'm talking about how I am going to discontinue my podcast. I'm going to discontinue my weekly email newsletter and instead focus on the live streaming platforms. I'm getting more uh, return on my investment, my human to human investment with live streaming than anything else I've ever done. And I don't care what the professionals or experts say. All I know is a businessman with 30 years of experience, I know what works for me. Right. And I encourage people, take a step away from the marketing expert trees, the hype that everyone's talking about out there and ask yourself what works for you. Okay. Right. And what do you enjoy doing? And for me, it's live streaming. It's meeting people like you. It's having people like this in the audience. This is what it's all about. And when you add live streaming with the mobile platform, one of the reasons we had a thousand people up at, up in San Francisco for Summit Live was because of mobile live streaming, whether it's Periscope, Blab, MeV or some of the other platforms. It's a game changer. It's going to make the world a better place and it makes doing business a hell of a lot more fun than it was 20 years ago. Yeah. And I, and I love the advice about writing down the 20 questions that you'd most get asked or that people would most want to know right sure. there when, because one of the big questions people ask a lot is, okay, I'm going to go on and I don't know what to say. Well, now you've got 20 shows you can do on Periscope, right? Each one of those with subsequent three to five points that you you use to explain your answer each one of those is a separate is a separate show so anybody who knows anything about anything right you have some topic that you're passionate about can be on one of these platforms and engaging and and informing and entertaining people right even if you're burned out on what you do for a living but you enjoy tennis or you enjoy riding horses or you enjoy knitting OK, you can answer you can do shows on those hobbies, on those passions and those interests. People will start connecting with you. You're going to have a good time doing the shows. And then over time, if somebody needs, um, you know, if, if let's say you make you do shirts, you, you manufacture shirts for a living. 
if I'm a horseback rider and I'm listening to your periscopes and we're connecting and building rapport and we're communicating in real time, when I need that shirt or those set of shirts made for my employees at my company, I'm going to reach out to you because we've got a relationship. That's what people really need to understand. And, you know, people will talk, Ross, real quick. How do you spend, how do you find the time to do this? And my response is, how do you not have the time to do this? This is a game changing uh, time in our lives. But what's really powerful is you do your Periscope. You download it onto your phone. You upload it to YouTube. You take bits and pieces and you repurpose it on the other platforms, okay? You use catch and you take that catch and embed it in your blog post. There's all types of ways to do something once and then repurpose it across all the other platforms for maximum exposure. It allows you to help more people that aren't just on the Periscope platform or the Blab platform. And that's what's worked really well for us over, over the years. Even so, I have to ask you the follow up on the time issue because sure. it's something everybody's struggling with now, right? It used to be you go to work, you come home at the end of the day, and that's it, right? You're done. And right, right. I, I mean, I could literally spend, when I go into New York City, I could literally spend the entire commute both ways just responding to Twitter because I've yeah. made it a policy to try and respond to every single person that engages me. And and more and more days go by where I'm just going like, I just don't want to do this every day on Twitter uh, because I I enjoy the live streaming and, and it's so much more fun. But something's right. got to give. So like when you arranged your schedule to be able to work in more live streaming, because I know, you know, a trial lawyer schedule is very busy and you have times where you're, you're, you're you know, you, you've got a lot of a lot on your plate and some pressure and things like that. And yet. Yep. Every day consistently, or it seems on a regular schedule, you get on Periscope, you you, you deliver, uh, you know, good quality information. Thank you. Usually, typically has nothing to do with probably the cases that you're working on. Um, so how, how have you made time or found time or did something else go by the wayside? Or how, how do you do that? Because I think it's something that a lot of people... Um, with well, schedules that aren't as intense as yours probably are still struggling to figure out because I know I am. <laughs> look, yeah, no, it, it's a challenge, okay? And the, the simple answer to your question is not what a lot of people want to hear, but it's the truth. And the truth is, is I just freaking out hustle. Mm -hmm. I try to outwork my competition in town. And if that means I have to get up an hour earlier or two hour earlier, two hours earlier in the morning to finish a blog post or do a couple of live streams, I'll do it. If it means I have to um, cram twice as much information into an eight hour day and get this stuff done, that's what I'll do. Okay, having said that, it's about working smart. Ross, it's about learning how to say no. I have a credenza over here I was gonna pan to, but I've got too much client material on my desk so I can't disclose it. But every time somebody asks me to do something, I look over at my credenza and I look at my family pictures. And I understand if I say yes, it's going to take me take time away from them. OK, so I've learned how to how to say the word no in a way where it keeps my free time open so that I can focus on the important things. The important things for me right now are my family, my relationships with my friends. When it comes to work, it's my practice and it's it's my online activity. This is part of my daily practicing law. I don't differentiate between working my files and being online. It's one big blur from an eight, during an eight-hour period. Now, having said all that, and I did a show last week on Periscope, or uh, what was I on? I was on something about time management, and I talked about different ways to manage your time, and I'm a strong proponent of that. Being quick when it comes to decisions, being decisive in the office. Too many people spend too much time wondering about the decisions that they're going to make and they'll spend three hours on a 30 second decision so once you learn how to manage your day and make fast decisions over the long term it opens up your calendar and it gives you more time to do the things that are important to you or important to me and um and it's a balance i'm a firm believer that having said all that you know get it done between nine and five get it done between seven and ten you know spend time for your make time for your right. family Make time for your hobbies. Make time for your health. I'm not suggesting anybody work all night long, but what I'm saying is work smarter, not harder. And that's been my key. Uh, it's it's a lot of hard work, Ross. There's no, you know, I don't have any secret sauce on that. 
and in doing that with your your social media engagement, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, all that kind of stuff, is there uh, any techniques you use to sort of speed your time to market on that stuff? Do you batch? Do you do you schedule mm-hmm. a certain amount of time? Um, because I know I can count on, um, regardless of what I post, I can count on a response from you, like probably within a few yeah. hours or that same day. Um, you, you, you're you're always on top of what's going on with live streaming, with social media. Um, you don't seem to fall behind on on uh, on what's going on. And so, my my wondering is how you you know is there a secret or it's like you said you just hustle, you do other things faster, and you're constantly checking your phone as, as you go from one thing to the next. You know, I I have a job where when I'm in the office, my my desktop computer that I'm looking at right now everything's fired up on it. I mean, you know, Twitter, LinkedIn, email, all my platforms are here. So it's really easy for me to to work and look over and check things, okay? And um, when I'm on the go, and one reason I'm a big fan of mobile live streaming right now is wherever we are, it's so easy to simply check, respond, comment, keep updated as to what's going on. So I think, you know, it's just a matter of, 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 this is my priority this is what I enjoy doing, so I'm making it a priority. And having said that, I'm also pretty fast with this stuff. I mean, I built our first website in 1996. I know how to code. I know how to do this stuff. I know how to how to play around and manipulate the social platforms as far as uploading content. And so I'm pretty fast at this stuff. That helps. But here's the thing. The more you do it, the better you get, right? So if somebody's just getting started and they're, they're taking more time than they like with Twitter and Facebook and Periscope and Blab, my, my thought process is just keep at it. And the more you do it, the faster you'll get, the more you'll appreciate what's important and what's not. And you'll learn what you need to respond to and what can wait until, you know, later on at night when you're sitting on the couch, chilling out. Sometimes that's when I'll pop up Snapchat and watch other people's stories. I, I, I'm more of a I'm more of somebody that's trying to produce content, Ross, as a as opposed to digesting everybody else's content. I'll be honest with you, I just don't have time to do that. And um, it's one of these things where a lot of people spend all their time digesting content, and they're not taking enough time taking action, okay, right. moving forward towards their goals. So my priority is to is to share value, and then once that's done, when I have time, then I'll take a step back and I'll start digesting everybody else's content. So before we move on to the sort of heart of the legal uh, aspect of our, our discussion, um, tell me about Periscope Summit. I, I unfortunately wasn't able to make it. Um, I, I heard that it's you know a great experience. The the Periscope. Mm-hmm community summits what did you take away from it like three three things that maybe sure. those of us who aren't on top of periscope every single day or couldn't go to the summit would like to know about you know what's going to be happening with periscope it, it was a lot of fun and i was slated to speak on friday on uh, a legal issues pan- panel and then on saturday on a uh, internet uh, harassment and trolls panel as things turned out, I got ordered out to trial. So I couldn't go up for the entire period of time. So I had to fly out of Orange County early Friday morning. I spent the whole day in San Francisco and then flew ba- back late Friday night. So I didn't go to all the different activities. I had to miss the blab uh, uh, get together because I had to catch a plane. But my takeaway, Ross, was the excitement, the enthusiasm, the reality of mobile live streaming. I mean, when you look at the people that were that were so enthusiastic about live streaming for their business, live streaming to promote social causes, uh, community service organizations. There are some really sharp people doing some really amazing things who have invested their time and their energy and are all in on live streaming. That tells me, regardless of the platform, whether it's Periscope, uh, Mevi, Blab, whatever it might be, that tells me that the live streaming bi-directional real-time mobile platforms are here to stay. They're going to be exponentially more important as 2016 progresses. So my takeaway was, okay, I'm in the right place at the right time, surrounded by the right people who are all, for the most part, involved in live streaming for the right reasons. That was my general umbrella takeaway. Okay. Right. There were weren't a whole lot of new tips and techniques and things like that other than gadgets. But the bottom line is, for those of you on Blab, for those of you on Periscope and using live streaming, you're in the right place and you're on the right platforms. We're going to change the world. 
it's here to stay, right? It's not only here to stay, it's going to change everything. You know, information, now that we, you have somebody in South Sudan who has access to one of these, uh, who can see what's happening over the rest of the world, um, it's information, it's education. It's, this is going to change everything, not just business, but it's going to change the world in a good way socially. And that's what's exciting to be a part of. Awesome. Um, let's talk about the influencer issue because you wrote a, a great blog post um, about what influencers on social media who endorse products, whether they're live streaming or they're on Twitter, Facebook, what have you. Um, there's legal issues involved and there's things that people need to know. And I, I remember when I first um, started working, I worked for a newspaper, I worked for a radio station, and I had to sign something saying I wouldn't take gifts, uh, you know, uh, in exchange for favors or things like that. And the internet to some degree is still like the wild west, right? I mean, a lot of people become big before they've thought about how you know, they need to run a business or what legal issues are involved. So let's let's start. Um, somebody all of a sudden finds figures out, OK, wow, I've got 5000. I've got 10,000. Now I've got 20,000, whatever you have followers on Twitter. You've got a, a, a you're kicking it on Instagram. And all of a sudden people are saying like, OK, we'd like you to endorse our product. Um, you can go sure. to this event for free. Here's, a, you know, free book. Read it. Maybe you'll tweet about it, whatever. What what is the what does that person have to start to think about in order to ensure that they stay on the right side of the law? Well, well, let me first say that I love the entrepreneurial aspect of live streaming and social media. And for example, Brian Fanzo is here, and I love what Brian's doing. Okay, and what I've noticed is that we have a lot of millennials attacking the business world, attacking old school businesses with new school with new ideas. To, to expand their sphere of influence, to help others, uh, to market their businesses without the artificial constraints of how we used to do business. So for me, it's really, really exciting. I love seeking, seeing people jump on these things and just go for it and then kind of figure things out as they go. I mean, a lot of people know what they're doing ahead of time, but to me, that's the most exciting part as a lawyer, okay? The law is changing, things are changing. We're all trying to keep up with technology. Now, having said all that, um, What's, what's fascinating to me is that old school and offline business principles still apply online, if not more so. They're magnified online because our reach is larger. We're now not now I'm not talking to a, a Southern California audience. I'm talking to a global audience, right? So you have to take into consideration all types of things, whether it's it's litigation venue, whether it's disclaimers, whether it's local state laws, federal laws allowing you to say what you want to say and how you want to say it. So there's a multitude of issues that come into play now that we're all live on Blab, on Periscope, on the live streaming platforms. And that to me is really, really fascinating. I spoke with a young man in San Francisco after the legal panel who realized he wasn't doing probably all the steps he should be doing before selling his products and services on Periscope. And we talked a little bit and I told him, I said, listen, off the record, and this is away from the cameras and microphones. I said, I love what you're doing. Dude, right. you're an entrepreneur. Just keep doing what you're doing. But think about some of the things that I shared with you and start incorporating them into, into your daily activities. I tell people, look, if you're going to sell products or services on, online, become a corporation, become a limited liability company first mm -hmm. offline and do business online as a business entity. I'm a lawyer, everyone. I'm not your lawyer. Check with a lawyer in your state, depending on what you do for a living, depending on your state laws, your choice of entity varies. But the bottom line is you should do business as some type of business entity. You know, you want to have certain documents set up so that if I'm selling a product out of California, that somebody in New York's not happy about and they bring a lawsuit, I want to make sure that I don't have to travel to New York to defend myself. I want to have a venue clause here in Orange County, California. Those are two examples of what business people need to think about when doing business online, especially live streaming. I'm trying to look at the comments over here while I'm speaking and it's really, really hard. But uh, what I want to point out just real quick, Ross, in case anybody has to leave, is at streaminglawyer.com, and it went live about five minutes ago, I shared a blog post with the FTC endorsement rules and a link 
to the FTC PDF. So if people, when we talk about endorsing products, have additional questions and they're not able to reach you or me, if they go to streaminglawyer.com, the most recent blog post will have a link that will take you to the FTC document and you can read it tonight at your own time. And those rules regarding endorsements um, cover a lot of things that I think people who are likely to to watch or either here with us now or likely to watch this um, sure. are involved in. I mean, everything from blogging to YouTube videos, um, gift exchanges and, and so forth. So um, should we all be putting right. um, disclaimers uh, like legal language on our websites? I mean, no. should we no. should we be doing what they used to do in, uh, you know, baseball games where they'd always read that, uh, you know, this game is uh whatever of the, the major league baseball used to have, you know what I'm talking about, right? Like, I do. I do. No, 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 no. You no. Stop and read it in like the sixth inning every time. Like, you know, don't reproduce this. <laughs> yeah, those darn lawyers. They make us do all this stuff. That's unnatural. <laughs> huh? Look, here's the deal. If you're, if you're for commercial purposes, if you're endorsing a product, you're being paid to use a product. If you're being paid to endorse a product, if you're exchanging your endorsement for free services or other courtesies, it's really, really important that there's full disclosure. The disclosure level has to be clear and conspicuous. As long as you're doing that, then you're in good shape. Where we see, and that applies to any type of marketing or advertising, it applies to live streaming and social media. The issues that we see coming up are if you are uploading a video to YouTube and you're endorsing a product in that video, where do you put your, your uh, disclosure? at the beginning of the YouTube video, at the end of the YouTube video, in the show notes of the YouTube video. As a lawyer, I would suggest you do it in all three. There are ways to do it in a natural way so it doesn't disrupt your product, your show, or your service. All you have to say is, you know, this is Mitch Jackson, and um, I'm going to be talking about this particular stapler today. It's a product that the company did share with me at no charge. I will tell you exactly what I think about the product, but I want you to know where it came from. As long as there's some kind of disclosure like that, you're okay. The same thing applies to podcasts. The same thing applies to any type of, of social media or live streaming message. You have to have the full disclosure. Likes on Facebook. If you're being paid to like a product or service, you know how do you make that disclosure? If I'm being paid on Twitter to promote a product or service in my tweets, and a lot of influencers are asked to do this, and they should be. They're influencing. They're making the world a better place. The right influencers are. Well, they need to be aware, though, that when they tweet out, even in 140 characters, it has to be clear and uh, conspicuous that that tweet is being brought to them, brought to their user base, brought to their audience uh, in a form where they're either being paid to do it. It's an advertisement. In the article I shared, uh, the FTC said hashtag ad, AD, oftentimes will be sufficient at the end of the tweet to give the user notice that, in fact, it's a paid endorsement type of tweet. Okay. Wow. So it's just kind of an interesting thing where we have so many quickly changing digital platforms that don't really allow us to share these disclaimers on the platform. How do you do it? If I have a blogger website and I'm promoting a product, I saw over at uh, CES, there's a new droid, a new, yeah, a new, a new uh, what do you call them? Flying uh, drones? Drones. And uh, it'll take a human being. It looks like a little, little golf cart. Right, right. You can get in it and it'll fly you around, okay? So if that company was nice enough to, to make one of those available to me, and give it to me in exchange for me endorsing it. And I do so on my website. The next question is, do I have to do a disclaimer on each and every page of the website that I talk about that product? Can I include just a link on the website, the link to a master disclaimer? It just depends on what the products or services are. If you're, if you're selling financial services that people rely upon and can really harm them to their detriment, if your advice is not good, the disclaimer requirements are much greater than if I was just selling bathing suits in the summer in Cape Cod. Right, right. So it's kind of a flexible uh, standard depending on what your products or services are. And what's the fine line between um, a review of a product and an endorsement? Because a review of a product can come from an objective place and it can come uh, with, sure, with sure. a wink and a nudge. And, uh, you know what I mean? Like uh, there's blogs that, you know, you, you, you can Google some product, right? And, and it's often hard to tell whether um, 
you're reading an objective review or you're reading something that somebody was paid to to sort of place in on different websites sure sure so look if i alex khan just joined us so let's say i got alex and brian brian fanzo and um i decided that i really liked alex's periscope that he did earlier today and it was a good one alex thanks or brian's blog post from yesterday as a consumer if i simply comment about them or their their work product that doesn't fall under a commercial type of endorsement i'm just one person commenting about what they're doing because you're not if, being compensated i'm not receiving any benefit whether it's compensation whether it's i'm giving them my endorsement in exchange for them doing xyz for me whatever it might be some type of consideration in a commercial environment if we have a business arrangement whatever that might be to scratch each other's back then the end user the consumer has the right to know about that it's one of these things where if you go to somebody's website who you trust Ross I go to your website and I see you mentioning a really cool tripod for the iPhone that you highly recommend okay am I going to rely upon that as a consumer if I like you if I trust you if I follow your your website and your blog geez if, if it's good enough for Ross you know what maybe I'll give it a try now if I didn't know that this company was paying you to promote that blog post, okay? Or if I didn't know that you were part owner in that company, don't you think those would be questions that I would want to know the answer to before relying upon making a purchase? So it all comes down to what will a consumer, exp what should a consumer know? What's fair in order for that consumer to have full transparency and an understanding as to what that relationship is. So that's 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 the way it works. It's a commercial commercial transaction. That's great. Um, Livestream Stars is brought to you by Livestream Universe, livestreamuniverse.com. Check us out on the web. Uh, Mitch Jackson, it is so great to have you on here. Um, the, seat, the seat is open. Please jump in with your, your questions. Uh, we we want to get as many as we can up until the to the top of the hour. Um, and here is Brian Fanzo right on cue. So Brian, right. thank you for hopping on. Uh, I saw your question in the chat box. Just fire away. Great yeah, question. I figured what I'd up, Brian? It. So I, I'm a big fan of what you guys are doing. Love, love all the content as always. Um, Thanks, Brian. So this is one real world, right? So, um, so I'm doing an event next week in uh, San Francisco for, at the uh, Super Bowl Fan Extreme Zone, right? And so awesome. we're getting paid by SAP and a couple of brands to go there. And we have 34 blabs scheduled. We're doing some periscopes there. Um, but the idea, the, the interesting thing, what, what you brought up, Mitch, and I, I guess I hadn't thought of it, is we're, sure. we're, we're rewarding a group of people that are going to be on our team that are going to be periscoping or live streaming from their own environment. But we're asking other people to amplify it if they see us on the blabs, on the shows. What is that? Where, where's that sticky area? Where, where do I... Do I, what do I have to tell them that they don't get in trouble and then I don't get in trouble too? So that's a, it's a real world question because it came to my head as soon as you. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, before I answer that question, I want to ask you, cause I snapped it yesterday before I saw that your Jeep got stuck in the snow. Jeep is out. Jeep is out. I was giving you a hard time. I was like, <laughs> show me what that bad boy does in the snow. So well, I, okay. I, I, I cracked the drive shaft. So I lost four wheel drive uh, thinking that my Jeep was uh, indestructible. And then, Jeep with no four wheel drive is might as well just be a uh, a dead paperweight. Right. So that's why I'm, I'm I'm the Jeep's fine. We're still buried in snow. Okay, okay. I, I was just curious because our snaps kind of went back and forth. I'm like, oh geez, bad topic. So listen, if you have 30 people that are helping you promote via Periscope this event, and those 30 people have some incentive to bring people onto the Periscope program, whatever it might be, discounted tickets, endorsements by you, whatever it might be, they Look, under the FTC rules, they absolutely need to disclose that relationship. And you can do it tactfully and in a way that you can have fun doing it. You know, I'm, you know, I'm here on behalf of uh, what's the name of the group that you're representing? So, I mean, it's, it's the project SB50 Disrupt, but we're on. on SB50. Yeah. And, but we're on behalf of SAP North America. And I guess the difference for me is we have one group that we're asking and we're giving something. And then we have another group where I'm making just the ask. Hey, guys. It's, it's really my right hook. Like, hey, I've always promoted your content. Right. I could really use a share on this. They're not getting anything in direct return that group is. The first group is, and I know that. And I'm actually, that's why their so, graphic will be on the site. But the other group that I'm just making the right hook for the ask without them getting anything in return, how does how does that one work? Yeah, so here's the thing. Um, I actually just uploaded the PDF from the FTC at streaminglawyer.com. It's the most recent blog post. It's only like 16 pages. Get it and download it because you're in the big leagues. 
Super Bowl, right? Yep. A lot of eyeballs. There's a lot of eyeballs, and all it takes is one person to be upset, one competitor to be concerned about what they're seeing or not seeing, and then it's game on, and then I'm in business, and we don't want me to be in business. That's no fun, right? No. Nope. So, so what I would do is have everybody that is receiving a benefit on behalf of broadcasting on your behalf to simply in one sentence indicate their status with your organization or with the event, and then you're good to go. That's my recommendation. Perfect. No, that's exactly it. And you know, I have streaminglawyer.com is in my feed to read yeah. every day. So if you have one up there that, that's new, I, it'll be in my flipboard tonight. So I will definitely okay. read yeah. it. But yeah, great stuff, guys. Ross, thanks for having awesome. me on. Mitch, thanks, Brian. It's always a pleasure, guys. Well, great thanks, stuff. Brian. I really appreciate him coming by. That sounds exciting. You know, yeah. imagine live streaming the Super Bowl. How cool is that? <laughs> no. That's that awesome. so cool. Get it, getting paid to do what you're going to do anyway, right? But but being able to bring it to so many people, that is that is just awesome. Um, it's awesome. It's awesome. But it's also one of those things where if these rules are ever going to apply, that's the platform, that's the venue yeah. where you want to cross your T's and dot your I's because that's where competitors are really looking at what everybody else is doing. And if you're not following careful. Brian, you've got to follow at iSocialFans on Twitter, um, his website, iSocialFans.com. Um, anything that's going on in live streaming, Brian is is on top of it. Always has uh, great ideas on on what's going on with live streaming and social media. How things can can be done better. Um, just some great periscopes as well. So um, definitely check out his his website and, and, and Twitter feed. Um, one of the things um, that's a, that is interesting regarding this is some people here may be in the position of being the advertiser rather than the influencer. So what what did they need to know? And and that kind of lends itself based upon what Brian just asked. If you're an advertiser, if you're someone like Brian putting on this event and you have independent contractors out promoting your event, your products or services, uh, if you're an advertiser and you've got uh, independent agents uh, going out and promoting your products and services, network marketing companies, you have people going out selling your products or services. The FTC disclosure rules still apply. And as an advertiser, as a manufacturer who are, who are sending people out into the commercial workplace to promote your products and services, you have to make sure that they're complying with the FTC rules and regulations. Some of the things that um, advertisers can do, Ross, to protect themselves, because imagine Brian's got 30 people out at Super Bowl uh, 50 doing their thing. How does he know what they are or are not doing? How do you know the people that you you trained are doing what they're supposed to do? And there's a couple of things that the FTC recommended, and that has to do with before you send these 30 people out into the game, into the community, uh, into the stadium, you need to sit down and you need to at least train them or provide them with clear and concise materials explaining the disclosure requirements. What do they need to do? That's the first thing. As long as you do that, you're probably going to be protecting yourself. Um, on ongoing projects, on, on long-term projects, you need some type of system where people are submitting reports, people are submitting data back to you so that you can show the FTC, if you're ever uh, reviewed, that you've complied with the FTC requirements. So that's always important is to have documentation supporting everything that you're asking people to do. Um, the same thing applies with companies selling products through affiliate programs. If you have affiliates out there selling your products and services, you have to make sure that you've taken the steps and you're able to show the FTC that you've taken reasonable steps to train your affiliates to comply with the FTC disclosure requirements. And then as long as you do that, and as long as there's some type of periodic oversight, some type of periodic review. Like a quick mention in a blog post. Like if you're blog posting about, you know, and you can click here to buy this product or whatever, you need to mention somewhere that, you know, this is an affiliate link, but I only endorse products that I use myself or some you know, you can you can couch it in, in positive terms. Right. But you have to you can't avoid that. Right. Yeah. And, and there are, you know, Chris Brogan does a great job at his blog by by openly going out of his way to let everyone know that the link he's sharing is an affiliate link. Mm -hmm. And he's a good example of how to do it the right way. And uh, on the other side of the coin, though, if I'm simply sharing your blog post, Ross, or Brian's Super Bowl 
uh, page, his link, his the, the company that he'll be uh, uh, sharing services and performing services for with my audience with no expectation of any type of gain, whether it's financial, whether it's Brian sending me Super Bowl tickets, right. um, and that disclosure is not required because it's not a it's not a commercial transaction. Right, right. So, so you know, what what do you see like looking forward in terms of how the law may change, what the government may do um, when it comes to either live streaming, social media, or just the internet in general? There's been a debate about net neutrality and different things like do you see the internet becoming more regulated? Do you see um, more legal issues arising? Or do you think um, things are going to kind of continue where they're at right now? Well, I think we have privacy concerns that the general public has. I mean, what's our reasonable expectation to privacy? I'm one of those people where I put it all out there. I like being transparent. I like these platforms, so I'm in favor of them. I'm not in favor of laws that restrict these platforms or our use on these platforms or taxing uh, profits made on these platforms. So we'll see what happens. I mean, anytime you have a new bell or whistle that's delivered onto the playing field, people approach that issue from different perspectives. And, you know, you've got business interest, you've got political interest. I get all that. I'm not a mind reader. I don't know what's going to happen, Ross, but I will tell you that it looks to me as though uh, live streaming, Blab, Periscope platforms like these platforms are going to continue to exponentially get more and more popular. And I think as companies understand the power of live streaming to build communities and to build relationships as opposed to selling products and services, I think that's where we'll see the next evolution of the power of live streaming. So it's going to be a fun ride. And uh, it always takes years for the law to catch up with technology. <laughs> right, right. And I think that's the general rule. I think with this type of technology, it's going to take a lot more than years. It's going to take a long, long time. Well, well, I'm glad there hasn't been an overreaction because uh, I, I love the, the fact that it's such a free and open forum and it's, it yeah. is a great place for entrepreneurs. Um, with the Super Bowl coming up, we still welcome any any legal questions, any um, questions about live streaming or social media. Um, but I, I want to change gears a little bit because you had a great blog post uh, about the concussion issue, about the mm. Will Smith movie. The Super Bowl is coming up. Um, and this is a tough issue for a lot of us who grew up with football really embedded in our in our culture, whether you're in a a town where high school football is king or you're in an area where college football is king or you're around one of the major pro teams that has, has a big time support watching that game every every uh, week on on uh, in the fall and into the winter is probably something that you did you love to do you might have played yourself and now we're really realizing that the body isn't made to play football and particularly the brain is is really suffering some horrific injuries and the people who yeah. play these games particularly those who continue to play as adults and as professionals are, are, are suffering i mean they're in their late 30s and 40s and some of them can't tie their shoes some of them you know need 24-hour care um their, their lifespan is shorter they get depressed more often they have trouble remembering um before yeah, i bring everything down um <laughs> but this is this is the reality. And, and how do we come to grips with the fact that we know this reality, but we still love the game. We still support it. It's still a huge industry. <laughs> where where yeah. are you at with all this, knowing what you know from the cases you've worked on, from from talking about this issue, but also from being a sports fan, being an active person yourself? Sure. You know, you, you well, know, I mean, played some football. Right. I mean. Right yeah. there. Awesome. Awesome. Highlight, you know, by the way, I watched you know, uh, one of your videos where you uh, had highlights of them. It's really cool. Well, uh, yeah. G money tore it up on the field last <laughs> year. And then after, and then after seeing uh, the movie concussion, I just felt like the worst dad in the world. Um, yeah. I've represented players uh, with brain injuries that uh, took place on the football field. I played myself. Okay. I tell all my friends, had it not been for football, I'd be sitting on the U S Supreme court right now. So, <laughs> <laughs> You know, there are consequences to playing ball. I get all that. Um, I'm glad Garrett's playing soccer this year. He's going to wrap up his high school career and hopefully play soccer in college. That's what he wants to do. And he's got my support. It's uh, 
it's an interesting phenomena when you when you actually talk with the doctors and when you represent wonderful young men who have sustained life changing, uh, life altering brain damage, which is what I've done, and it gives you a different perspective on what's going on out there. And I think the movie really puts things into perspective, especially when you look at the Mike Webster story, and that's how the movie starts off. So. You know, I love the sport. There's nothing more exciting than watching football. Having said that, um, now that I know what I know, you know, I don't think I – I wouldn't encourage my son to play. Uh, the downside substantially outweighs the upside. Now, speaking of the Super Bowl, though, Ross, mm -hmm. one of the questions that came up at Periscope Live or Summit Live is that do people have the right to bring – to pull out their, their smartphones and Periscope while in the Super Bowl? OK, can they go down and interview the cheerleaders? Can they periscope from the stands? Do they have the right to live stream from different events? And that was one of the more popular questions that we got both while on the stage and afterwards one on one. And it's interesting because you see people periscoping, periscoping MMA fights, big fights, right? You see per people periscoping, uh, easy for me to say, it's been, a, it's been a long day, my friends, very long days to see people scoping concerts and things like that. I watched David Merriman Scott speak from the stage at a Tony Robbins event the other night. And David's a friend of mine. And it was so cool because I got to watch him do his thing from a Tony Robbins event in Florida while I'm sitting in my backyard in my spa, my jacuzzi. So it was, I love the technology. And what we tell people is, look, if it's a private event without the permission of the event uh, uh, owner, you probably don't have the right to scope. Now, most smart event owners, promoters, they understand the power and amplification that live streaming brings, and they encourage people to live stream. They encourage people to share with their audience. I'm wondering what's going to happen at the Super Bowl. I don't know if Brian's still around, but I'm going to reach out to him because I'm curious to see what their official take is with fans live streaming from the stands. It would be very, very hard to monitor and control. OK, but if I was throwing on an event like that, I would make sure I had extra Wi-Fi throughout the stadium and I would have the announcers and the people in the stands and the ushers suggesting shots, promoting shots, just getting it out there. I mean, really encouraging all of the above. And I wrote an article for Amusement Park magazine talking about live streaming at Disneyland and Legoland and things like this. And they're really worried about it because of liability reasons. You know, God forbid somebody's live streaming a roller coaster when it flies off the tracks and somebody gets hurt. That's the downside. I think the upside is you can encourage amusement park employees, uh, managers, officers, and directors to train their staff to encourage really unique live streaming angles, live streaming shots. Ross, that's a great shot right there. But if you take your family over to this section over here, it's a much more engaging live stream. You right, know? In right. fact, Goofy's right there. If you grab Goofy, he may join you for your next live streaming shot. I think it's a great way to promote products and services. I think the consumers will embrace this technology as more of us get comfortable with the technology. Yeah. And I think that's the hurdle right now. It, it's it's a fascinating issue. It really is for the for the Super Bowl. I mean, how, first of all, how do you tell whether somebody's using their phone to take a picture or or shoot a video. I mean, you can't you can't take a phone out of everybody's hand, right? Because they definitely want you to take pictures and put them on Instagram, put them on Facebook and, and everywhere else. Um, and, and realistically, whatever video I shoot with my my phone can't really compare to what AB, ABC or CBS or NBC can do with the Super Bowl. Right. I don't think anybody's going to go like I'm going to watch this on Ross's Periscope uh, versus watching it on uh, on network TV. Right. Um, but that's are, the reality. But yeah. there are issues with it. Um, and, and also it depends, I guess, what you do with like if you're using your periscope to, to show live how the crowd is reacting, you know, to show to talk to to fans around you. Hey, we're having a great time over here. I think that's quite different than trying to, like, you know, actually do a full broadcast of the game on periscope or whatever in which you're really competing w with the rights holder. So I think, you know. Even like, you know, it's fine to bring a phone or a camera that shoots video, but don't try and bring a big video camera in to the to the stadium. They'll never allow that. So I think it's, it, you know, it's kind of what yeah. your intentions are, too, to how much uh, people may may start to become bothered by what you're doing. But I, I'm sure artists like for concerts don't want their music live stream because 
Somebody can be using catch. Somebody can make a, you know, quality is going to get to the point, right, where that's going to be a new way to bootleg a concert, right, and, and make a bootleg, uh, you know, a CD Absolutely. or video or whatever will be through live streaming it. Yeah, you look at how you look at how the Grateful Dead. Hey, Nick, it's good to see you. You look at how the Grateful Dead has always allowed videotaping and photo photography at their concerts. Okay, they got it. The Grateful Dead got it and and embraced this technology back in the day to help sell records, to help share their music with the world. And I think Ross, for the time being, you're right. The quality of a broadcast isn't up there with whoever's paid for the rights to to show the, the Super Bowl around the world. But in two to three years, you get Periscope Ryan in there, Ryan Steinholfson with all of his gadgets, and he'll be shooting real-time HD quality probably from the 50-yard line. So the technology will be there. And then the next question is, um, how can we all embrace all of that to give the end user, to give the consumer a better experience? And when it's all said and done, with everything we've talked about, with everything we're doing, it's all about the consumer's experience. Well, then That's the next level is can somebody monetize that? Are there going to be commercials on somebody's Periscope stream? Are they going to be getting yeah. endorsements that take away from the networks who, of course, are making plenty of money by uh, by by doing the Super Bowl? Nick, fire away. You got, you got a great question, I see. Hi, Ross. Yeah, hi, Mitch. How are you? Good to see you both. Yeah, Good I used to uh, figure I'd pop in and say hi and ask the question rather than do it from the chat. But do you, cool. do you see live stream documentation – making its way into the courtroom. I, I'm assuming that sooner or later we're going to get the accident caught on video. We're going to get the, you know, crime sure. caught on video. Do you see that happening in the future? Has it happened yet that you're aware of? It, I, I do see that, and yes, it has happened. And by the way, I really enjoyed having lunch with you up at San Francisco. We've got to do it again. Yes. Nick and I had a great lunch together, and it was one of my highlights. A um, couple of things. You look at the two knuckleheads up in Sacramento. I was up there for a wedding who decided to use Periscope while they were out to do like a gang hit. I don't know if you guys remember that. And they filmed themselves. It. Well, I, I watched some of it. And they filmed themselves live uh, going down to take out a rival gang member. Okay. And the police officers loved it because they recognized who these two knuckleheads were. And both these guys were arrested early the next morning. And uh, Mike Byers, who's one of the police officers that uses Blab, said, we love this stuff. I mean, these criminals want to put themselves on live streaming, do it all day long because it makes our job a heck of a lot easier. Um, we had a case not too long ago, Nick, where, and you'll like this because Nick's got experts.com. He shares experts and, and connects lawyers with experts, okay? And um, we had a, a large case, Nick, where the insurance company for the other side on an intersection accident where our client was severely injured, uh, the expert for the other side shortly after the accident made a, uh, a determination or a finding that the light sequence of the intersection could not have been such that it was their insurance fault. It must have been our client's fault. And exactly. so what we were able to do is we were able to go out using Periscope. Uh, we were able to go out and take the uh, video from the intersection that existed at the time of the accident and then have our experts go out after the fact and show that the lighting sequence that they were relying upon to deny a claim actually was different than what it really was. And in fact, it was their insured's fault, not our clients. And what was interesting is we were able to use live streaming from wow. the scene of the location to show uh, two other experts and one claims adjuster exactly what the true live, the true sequence of the lights was at the time, in wow. real time. That's and, fantastic. Yeah, and one of the adjusters said, hey, Mitch, can you, um, I don't necessarily agree with you, but can you like pan to the right a little bit so I can make sure the street you're showing me is the name of the street that you're telling me it is. And so we were able to do a real-time intersection analysis using live streaming, and it resulted in the case settling for an additional $700,000. Wow. So it's the best, it was the best use of live streaming I've used uh, personally as a lawyer in the last three or four months. It was really, That's really cool. That's fantastic. Yeah, good to hear. That's That, that uh, Periscope usage is exactly what I was thinking. Um, as far as an accident went, but I was also wondering how difficult will it be, and this may be too too detailed for today, but how difficult will it be for you to get, uh, if one of your plaintiffs, can you request those records from Periscope or Twitter fairly easily? So in California, 
we have the CEB introduction of evidence. And you're probably familiar with that. You're in California. And I was asked to be a co-contributor to a new chapter this past year on the introduction of social media and live streaming evidence. I think it's chapter 52. And what we realized while we were putting this chapter together and doing research is that the traditional laws of introducing evidence in court obviously apply to social media and the digital platforms. And just between you and me, um, it's actually easier, okay? Because, yes, because, because the files are there. Um, everything, instead of us having to go out and uh, create evidence on our own, the evidence already exists. It's on cell phones, it's on servers, it's on live stream platforms. And with the power of subpoena, we can gather that information, we can lay the foundation, establish authenticity, and then introduce it into a court of law. Oftentimes the opposing counsel will stipulate to the foundation and authenticity issues because they know that it's just, it's not a matter of if we're going to be able to do it, it's when. You wanna do it this morning during court, or do you want to make me work a couple of days and we'll do it on Thursday? Okay. So, so no, it's, it's huge. And I think what's really good about it is it helps the truth. It helps the true facts come out in front of a jury. And when it's all said and done, I think that's what we all want. Does that mean yeah. periscopes still exist after the 24 hours? Is that what you're saying? They still sit on a server somewhere? Oh, yeah. Don't, that's oh, my, that would be don't my think if somebody doesn't my get a subpoena within 24 hours that that video is gone forever, right? I mean, no. exactly. even if they're not using catch. Right. Exactly. Yeah. Once you once you uh, put something online, it's usually there for a long, long time because a lot of these companies have their own state and federal compliance uh, requirements. Okay. And whether it's based in law or to help protect against terrorism or if it has to do with tax issues, uh, this content's up there and it's available. So, you know, it's interesting. I love using, um, we impeached a, wheat, a witness on the witness stand based upon him taking the stand. It was on a, a bullying type of case where he testified under oath that he would never use these type of words. He wasn't that kind of human being. He would never treat my clients the way that we were alleging that he was treating our clients. Then I brought up his Facebook post, which he, he didn't know that I had. And of course, it was completely contrary to everything he just said in front of the jury. Yeah. So I took about 20 minutes, went down each comment on his Facebook, but, you know, derogatory comments towards women, his thoughts about our president, just everything in the world you wouldn't want in a court of law. And uh, I saw the judge kind of look over and give me like a, like a, it wasn't a wink, but he wanted to wink if he could have. Like, that right. was awesome. It was cool. And, and obviously the jury just thought the guy was an idiot. So. All right. Excellent. Well, thank you, Mitch. Thanks, Ross. I'm going to bounce out and let somebody else pop in. Good to nice see you. Thank you much, Nick. Uh, you, I hope we all see you uh, in April at Social Media Marketing World. I'll be there. Uh, you know what? Real quick, I just found out I'm going to be hosting uh, table talks during lunch. Excellent. So I'll be, I'll, I'll be down there, but I'll also be talking legal issues uh, during the lunch breaks with whoever wants to listen. Excellent. I'll see, I'll you, see there. you there. Okay. All right. See you, Nick. Bye-bye. Thanks, Nick. So, uh, What a great any- community. Yeah, isn't I mean so many great uh, questions today too. Um, it, it, that's really exciting though when you think about it. I mean, it's just making our society more transparent, isn't it? Sure. Because absolutely. Hey, absolutely. if we're all going to live our our lives in the public eye, might as well be held accountable for what what we're doing, right? I mean, if you're gonna if you're gonna say one thing and then do another, don't leave it out there. <laughs> you know, it's it's uh, it's one of these things where. It's I like it based upon what I do for a living because there always seems to be two sides to what happened. You know, one side says this happened, the other side says this happened, and the truth is someplace in between. And I actually would just rather know the truth right off the bat. I mean, that's just the way that's the way my mind works. And we've had cases where, you know, I love the fact that police officers are wearing, uh, you know, uh, the GoPro type of cameras now. It's good for them. It helps protect them from false allegations. And if there are any bad police officers out there that that abuse uh, the process, okay, um, excessive use of force cases, well, then it's going to be caught on camera. So it's good for everybody involved. I mean, there are good apples and bad apples in every bunch in every profession. And so having the live streaming, uh, uh, real-time bi-directional live streaming that's mobile now, I just think it's so cool and it's so much fun. And it's a great way for all of us to connect, to help each other. Um, people that uh, are in the comments here who and who have stepped in, Ross, 
are people where we've connected socially, we've connected on live stream, and in some situations we've connected professionally. And that's what makes getting up in the morning so damn much fun. You know, it's just a really cool environment to be a part of. So I'm really glad that I'm on the show. It's been a pleasure. Great to see Jason from Blab Help here too. Jason helped me out uh, yesterday because uh, I was having an issue with my my upcoming show. So um, Blab is just really great, really responsive, and, and and gets on things really quick. So big fans here too uh, uh, of Blab, not just using the platform, but but really big fan of uh, of what they're doing and what they're bringing to to the live streaming game. Last Absolutely. question, Mitch, before I let you go. Has anybody tried to live stream from the courtroom while you were working on a case? I have, but they won't let me. They won't let you, huh? You guys you guys remember Google Glass, right? So so I had two cases set for trial where I was going to try the cases with Google Glass. I wanted to pick my jury with Google Glass. It allowed me to do a live feed at the time through Google Hangouts and uh, the associates back at the office could watch me pick a jury and actually see the jurors' expressions while I'm doing that. My expert back in New York could communicate with me through the earbud through Google Glass and give me some follow-up questions based upon the responses the jurors give me. I thought it'd be an interesting dynamic to show people what happens inside the courtroom when you're picking a trial. Both cases settled. And so I had opposing counsel on board with using Google Glass. The judges were okay with me using Google Glass as long as everybody stipulated. And we're going to give it a try. What I want to see happen, Ross, and I'm going to ask you a question before we go. But Uh what I'm going to see happen is I want to see my jurors use applications like Periscope to communicate with me real time during a trial. So if I've got you on the witness stand, Ross, and let's just say it's a – the issue is what color was the right was the light when you entered the intersection? Okay, and I'm asking you questions, and green. I think I've got it covered. It was green, absolutely. And um, and uh, I want jurors to be able to communicate with me in real time while I'm cross examining a witness or while I'm going through some evidence, and ask me questions that I can look down and and they may say, you know, because what happens, Ross, is once the witness is excused, once the case is done, we walk out into the hallway and then we can talk to the jurors and we can ask the jurors what I always ask them, whether I win or lose, what could I have done differently? How could I have done a better job for my client? And then I stop talking and I start listening. Sometimes you hear the jurors make comments about witnesses or things that you didn't think were important. Okay. And I'd rather find out during the trial what they want me to ask a witness rather than after the fact. So I'd like to be able to look down in real time and have somebody using Periscope communicating me to me where I look down at my Apple Watch and I see a question coming in from juror number six to ask Ross, where did he find that really cool shirt? Because I don't care what color the light is. I want a shirt just like Ross. Hmm. Now, on that question, I'm going to ignore. Okay. That's right. a question that is not applicable to the case. Although somebody is obviously same, very observant, right? And I'll remember that. You know, I'll remember to wear that shirt when I give the closing argument and I'm looking at that juror. But somebody may ask the question Is this the same Ross brand? who belongs to the Rotary Club in Anaheim, because if it is, I've seen him leave leave the parking lot at 60 miles an hour, and I don't think he's a safe driver. It's not. Definitely not. And, and so, but it gives me information to right. follow up with. You know, Ross, by any chance, are you a Rotarian? No, I've always thought about being Rotarian, but I've never had the chance. Okay, I was just curious. So it's, familiar. it's almost like crowdsourcing in a way using the jury, although the jury is the one that's going to ultimately make the decision. So why that. shouldn't they get the information they need to know? But it's it's also, you know, I, I think there'd be less cases of, you know, where, you know, the story like the public defender fell asleep during the case and forgot to ask the, the three key questions or whatever. No attack on public defenders, but just saying that these situations, you know, people joke well, about, you know. But if that happens, if that happens. He was drunk that day, whatever. It, it, how amazing would it be if somebody in the jury took over, right, and said, you need to ask this question because we can't really know unless you ask the witness. You know, the, the you appellate, the imagine, imagine an appellate court looking at a live stream from the courtroom of that public defender sleeping at the counsel table. Right, right. And on appeal, you've got additional information that the appellate court can look at to overturn the verdict and send it back for a retrial. I just think the more information, the better. And the issue isn't that we that the judges don't want this information in the courtrooms. The issue is how can you monitor it so that the jurors are using these devices within the court rules 
as opposed to live streaming, you know, the Kardashians in the middle of closing argument. That's the problem. Okay. Right, right. So, so once we get all that worked out, uh, I think it will help people find justice in the courtroom more efficiently, more effectively, and I'm really excited to be a part of it. It's going to be fun. You know, I, I would love sometime to see a video from jury deliberation. I mean, because we all make assumptions, right? We all make Scary. assumptions about, oh, the jury, uh, you know, let this person off because they were good looking or the jury had a racial bias or a jury, you know, didn't fall for this uh, ploy by the defense attorney or whatever. But we never really know what the discussion was. There's there's usually one loud juror, right, who makes their feelings known. But how amazing would it be to see what the discussion is and how that could shape, right? Like how you would try a case, how it's an eye opener. You know, just just what what the level of justice really is for people. Is it is it what we think it is? Are people making decisions uh, on other things that you know we couldn't even believe what people are discussing in there? It's crazy. It's or, crazy. or are juries smarter than, than than even we give them credit for? Right. So uh, I would love to see to see that even if there was like a, a statute of limitations or something where you know you you know three years ten years have to go by or it has to be past any possible appeal or whatever. I'm sure. I'm just pretending to be a lawyer here. I have no idea what these terms mean, but. <laughs> But within that, there's like a kernel of wisdom in what I'm saying, right, Mitch? I mean, like, isn't there a way, like, even if 10 years later we were able to see how a jury deliberated, the lessons we could learn mm -hmm. that to, to use and to, to improve our, our, our justice system would be amazing, wouldn't they? It's my first year of practicing law, Ross. There was a seminar that I went to. My wife and I went to it. She's my partner. And it was a, you know, A to Z on how to try a case by some of the best lawyers in town. And they had a camera in the jury deliberation room. And all I remember about that day at the seminar was watching the jury deliberate and listening to the things that they were talking about. And I was blown away by what they were focusing on wasn't important at all. Some jurors got it. Some jurors didn't. Uh, it was an eye opener. And my takeaway was when you're trying a case, by the time the jury gets back into that jury deliberation room, it's too late. I mean, it's done. Win, lose, or draw, they've got the case. You can't introduce any more evidence, generally right. speaking. So my takeaway was you've got to put on your best case while you've got the jury in the box, while they're in the courtroom, because once they're gone, you're not in control of the situation anymore. I think that a lot of times from what I've seen, Ross, is they're asking questions. Things didn't get covered during the trial, so they're speculating. They're trying to figure out. They're trying to cross that T and dot that I because the lawyers in the courtroom didn't do it for them. So right. if we had technology, real-time technology during a trial where the jurors can ask those questions and the lawyers are trained to, on the fly, absorb this information, whether it's from your smartphone, whether it's from your Apple Watch, and tactfully incorporate it into your direct or cross-examination or your closing argument, at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, a much more efficient trial will take place, a much more complete trial, which means once the jury gets the case and they're gone, uh, they're going to have all the facts, they're going to appreciate what all the evidence is, they'll have the jury instructions, and they'll come to a fair and just decision. We live in the best legal system in the world by far what you read about in the paper what you see on tv the crazy stuff that happens is like one one hundredth right. of one percent and it, it because it's so unusual that's what makes the news that's what sells newspapers but in the real world what i've seen over 30 years is you know 99 times out of 100 what's supposed to happen happens and yeah. It would be really cool for another reason, Ross, to be able to live stream that stuff. And I'm not talking about the O.J. Simpson trial. That was that was a, a, a little bit different type of situation. But every, but day, every, every day, every day, justice. I am telling you, the average consumer would look at what's happening and realize it's not like Judge Judy. Okay, <laughs> it's not like what they see on TV. It's a very effective system with judges who, for the most part, really care about making sure that everybody has their day in court. And I think live streaming is going to be a big part of it. And once again, when I get the green light and the thumbs up and I can live stream my next trial, you'll be the first to know and we'll put it on Blab and we'll have some fun.
Beautiful. Thank you so much, Mitch. I really appreciate you taking the time to join. This was a great discussion and uh, look forward to meeting you when, when you're on the East Coast or I'm on the West Coast and, sure. and definitely look forward to continuing to collaborate on live streaming and, and, and other great social media endeavors. Oh, I would, I would love to. The pleasure was all mine. Thanks, everyone, for joining us today. I really appreciate the questions, the comments. It's hard to comment while we're while I'm being interviewed, but you know, you guys reach out to me if you have any follow-up questions at streaminglawyer.com. And uh, once again, this was the highlight of my day, Ross. Really enjoy seeing you again. You do such a good job of, of you guys. Let's all give Ross give Ross uh, high fives right here. You guys, come on, join me. You do a good job Thank of you, conducting a blab. It does not go unnoticed or unappreciated. Uh, Any time for you, my friend. And if you're out here in the West Coast, you track me down and we'll grab lunch. Okay. Sounds great. Streaminglawyer.com. Look them up. Mitch Jackson, at Mitch Jackson on Periscope. He's there. Great, great stuff. Um, and what is your Snapchat? I know you use a different address for Snapchat. Give everybody your, your Snapchat because you're, um, you're killing yeah, unfor- it on Snapchat. Unf- unfortunately, I'm loving Snapchat, you guys. It's so cool. I'm C-A, I'll type it in. I'm C-A underscore lawyer. Okay, so short for California lawyer, but connect with me. And it's a cool platform. If you guys aren't on Snapchat, check it out. It, it will complement everything else you're doing on social and live streaming. Trust me on that. Sounds All right. great. Thank you, Russ. Ross, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Mitch. Have a great right. night, everyone. Bye, everybody.